We appreciate you joining us here at Holland and Knight. Uh, we are excited to talk through some of the principles and recent developments in intellectual property and government contracting. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Wonderful. Uh, we're getting started a couple minutes late, so we're gonna go even faster than we had anticipated. Um, We'll do some quick introductions. Uh, I'm, my name is Chris Nagel, uh, and I'm joined today by our panelist, David Black, who's a partner in our Tyson's office. Here's me, and uh, Kelsey Hayes will be our other panelist today. Um, all three of us do government contracts work. We spend a lot of time in uh, counseling as well as litigation, and a significant part of our practice is in um, intellectual property. And um, both Kelsey and David have spent a lot of time uh, researching and analyzing, and um, in David's case, teaching on intellectual property in this area. Um, so we're anxious to hear their feedback. Um, I've spent a lot of time counseling clients in this way, and so my role is going to be to sort of uh, channel my clients and, and questions I've heard, uh, and David and Kelsey, I'm sure, will do the same, um, and we'll sort of present what we've heard from clients in terms of concerns and issues in this area. We're going to go through the basic principles and rights in a very quick manner um, and uh, with the understanding we need to circle back with us later um, if, if you haven't spent a lot of time in this area but we think a lot of the value add we can bring is in the new developments and re recent cases and pending rules so we'll spend most of our time in the new developments uh, and uh, and just kind of breeze through the the overview part of it um, and for that kelsey let me start with you um, I hear a lot from clients. Uh, we wanna protect our intellectual property. We wanna protect our IP. We're doing business with the government. We're nervous we're gonna lose our IP. Uh, and sometimes I think there's a disconnect on even what that is and what specifically we're talking about protecting and how it, and how it can be protected um, or not given the, the contractual situation. So can you talk us through uh, the two basic buckets that I think of in terms of patent rights and then um, and data rights on the other hand, uh, talk us through what that means and and how we see it applied day to day. Yeah, absolutely. So you kind of covered the two buckets there. Uh, government contracts, IP law breaks up uh, intellectual property law into patent rights, which is which are your rights in patents that you know you have filed and own um, and have a patent application for. Whereas uh, the other is rights in technical data and computer software. So think um, like computer source code or uh, documentation manuals, things like that, um, that you, the contractor, have created uh, possibly for the government's benefit or um, you know prior to entering the government uh, government contract. So the patent rights are you know it's the more in my head it's the more formal of the two buckets and then the technical data and com computer software is kind of a more um, is a broader concept um, but both are governed by uh, FAR subpart 27 and DFAR subpart 227 um, and both of these uh, regulations contain the requirements and um, the rights of each party with regard to uh, patents and uh, technical data. Yeah and, um, and I think of patents in terms of mm -hmm somebody can or can't um, use an invention, um, whereas technical data oftentimes is something that's produced um, and that the government, it may be a deliverable under the contract um, or it may not be, but um, it's a, as Kelsey said, it can be software. Uh, it can also be any sort of, any form, any uh, format of, um, of data, of information um, that's generated uh, either before or during the contract. Um, so talk to us very briefly, Kelsey, in a couple of minutes we have left on this section about um, general principles on patent rights, and then we'll talk quickly about um, technical data and then move into our, uh, our recent developments. Absolutely. So um, patent rights uh, starts with the principle of subject inventions. So we're thinking about inventions that were first conceived or reduced to practice while performing a government contract, and the case law has defined what that means and when that happens. Um, and so when that does happen, the contractor has an obligation to timely disclose the subject invention. Um, and then also uh, at that point, the contractor has to decide if it's going to elect to retain title and then file a patent application. Um, basically from there, uh, the principles of the, the regulations and intellectual property generally um, 
force the contractor to commercialize the item um, while retaining title to the subject convention if he elects to do so. It's kind of that balance of, um, you know, spreading spreading the knowledge, but also allowing the contractor to capitalize on um, something that uh, they invented. Um, yeah, and so unlike a lot of work that contractors do, we're talking about it literally a brand new invention, um, something that's never been put into practice before, um, and that is patentable, which is not the case, frankly. I think that this is the exception. I think um, technical data and computer software are much more um, the rule. This is typically what you develop under a government contract is not necessarily patentable, um, but the question becomes who gets to use it and how. Um, and so, Kelsey, you can talk us through the, what the general rules are with respect to um, technical data and computer software. Yeah, and so when we're talking about technical data and computer software, um, so we're talking about recorded information um, and, uh, you know, with computer software, we're talking about the program that allows the, the uh, system to run, the instructions, the rules, the routines. Um, so these are, you know, if you think of it in the broader context of intellectual property law, these are works of authorship, um, kind of like, you know, when you write a book, it's, it's an original thought that the contractor has come up with and put into writing. Um, but what's always the, the particular issue with government contracts and intellectual property is you've got, you know, this, the, the government paying with taxpayer dollars for something that the contractor invented. Um, so it's a little bit different than private agreements, right? Um, the government is entitled to a certain level of rights in these uh, these works of authorship deliverable items um, and presently there's not much room for negotiation really. Um, the regulations prescribe the different rights, uh, the allocation of rights uh, between the, the contractor party and the government uh, when these uh, items are developed. So this is so you can talk us through what the specific rights are but we're talking about generally anything that's developed under the contract um, or used under the contract. So, um, uh, what are the different what are the different buckets of rights that contractors and the government share, um, and and um, how do we know which one applies when? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you if you click to the next slide, that might be a more helpful visual while we talk through this. Um, this is uh, an image David created, and I absolutely love it because I think it clearly shows kind of the spectrum here of what's going on when we're um, talking about data rights. Um, so when you think about commercial, com a commercial license, uh, a com you know, it's the, it's what you're most familiar with in terms of the private agreement, right? The, the government just gets commercial license rights. It can't, it can't do um, beyond what a commercial party can do. Um, but then as, and that, and that starts over here in the spectrum when it's developed exclusively at uh, the contractor's expense. But then when you start mixing in federal dollars, when the government's paying for, you know, a certain extent of the data, then the government, of course, is going to want um, more, more rights, a broader license in the data developed under the, the government contract or using government funding. And so you can see that, um, you know, when you when you when you start to mix government funding um, and private funding, you know, it, it shifts along the spectrum until you get to the point where it's um, if it's fully developed with government funding, then the government usually takes unlimited rights in the data. Um, so this it, this image, I think, should really help drive you know drive in the mind that some of the principles that we're going to talk about as we go through proposal preparation um, and marking and the requirements when you look at the FAR and DFARS to just really make sure you're protecting your rights in, in technical data and not giving the government more than you have to. Let me underscore a couple of things here that I think are important on this slide. It's easy to miss and it's not necessarily intuitive. One is that first bullet there, the contractor retains title. That's critically important, and I get that question a lot from clients in terms of, well, I, I want to I own my, I want to own my technical data. I want to own what I've produced under this contract. And the truth of the matter is, in almost every instance, the default rule is the contractor owns the technical data or the computer software. Um, rather, it's been developed previously um, with using contractor dollars, or rather, it's developed using government dollars um, or mixed funding, as Kelsey said. So anywhere across that spectrum of this slide that we're looking at. The contractor, as a general rule, owns it. The question is, how many? What can the government do in terms of its use rights? It's like a license right. How how broad can the government take this thing and use it? Can it put it out in a solicitation so everybody in the world gets to see it? Um, can, is it forced to only use it for the very for the purposes 
for which um, it, it that it contracted um, to get those to get that technical data or to get that commercial software. Um, and so that's where you see the limited and restricted where the where the contractor is paid for it versus on the other side um, where uh, the government's paid for it and the government can basically do what it wants with it. But at the end of the day, the contractor continues to own technical data or the computer software and so it can use it for other purposes, again, as a general rule. Um, in the interest of time, because we're running a little bit behind already, I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides, but I would um, recommend uh, uh, that you go back and, and take a look at these. These are some of the more practical um, considerations uh, that we see just in terms of these high level rules. And we're going to get into some of the specifics as we talk through the recent developments here shortly. Um, but proposal preparation is obviously a critical time to protect these rights, as Kelsey mentioned. Um, when we talk about how do we how do we limit the use of the government? We know that the contractor generally gets to keep gets to own what's produced, but how do we limit how the government uses them? Um, and these are the the steps that are set forth, whether it's in the FAR and the DoD case, the DFARS, um, with making sure that the contractor retains um, the uh, restricts the use rights as much as possible. Marking and record keeping. There's some real um, kind of uh, uh, really um, unfortunate outcomes for contractors and, and very strict interpretation in some instances by judges who have said, look, the rules say you've got to mark it and you didn't mark it. Usually there's a process by which the contractor can go back and fix that, but sometimes you've seen cases where, that's not, where it doesn't happen. And so um, marking and following the rules, laying out in your proposal, here are the things that we as a contractor have already paid for. These are the most kind of practical um, considerations that we think about on the, on the front end of this to set the contractor up to maintain as much of the use rights as possible. Um, and then negotiating with subcontractors, you run into an issue with flow downs um, and where the subcontract, how much of the, what the subcontractor produces then is actually passed along in title to the prime contractor before it makes its way to the government, or does it skirt around the prime contractor in effect, which is I think what the rules generally suggest and that the um, prime contractor is there to deliver the, the um, technical data or the software, but doesn't take any rights in it. So these are all the kind of practical considerations that we work through with clients. And again, the slides are gonna provide a few more details on that, but I wanna make sure we leave enough time for all the new developments, um, cases and rules that we wanted to talk through. So we're gonna move on to this. Uh, and the first set of uh, recent developments relate to patent rights. So that first bucket that Kelsey was talking about, um, and David, I think, is going to walk us through uh, a recent case uh, and, and some lessons learned from that. David, to you. Okay. All right. Thanks. It's a great intro. Yeah, I want to talk about this uh, case uh, that uh, was decided last year. Um, it's currently up on appeal. We're all kind of waiting for the Federal Circuit's decision. But it teaches some important lessons about what is a subject invention. And this is a story about a contractor that thought it had an invention um, that, that had uh, come into existence before the award of a government contract. Um, it, it used funding to develop that invention a little further and it turned out it got, it converted its invention into a subject invention in which the government acquired an unlimited rights license. So this is, this is a contractor stubbing its toe unintentionally and I think it, it uh, teaches something useful. So the, the facts, I think, are helpful because there is this sort of fog of, de of developing new technology. And, you know, these are uh, fast paced activities, emerging companies, and, and there's not a, uh, sometimes the amount of uh, forethought that, that would be in every, everyone's interest. And I think you'll get a sense for that. So this uh, required work back in the 2006, 2007 time period. Um, the contractor was developing a new uh, vehicle for army soldiers that would basically protect them from um, all kinds of, of munitions. Um, and it would you know, do that more effectively, they, they claim. And so they first had a, a contract uh, called a Rapid uh, Equipping Force Contract. It was a short-term contract um, where they, they tested some of the armor, the armor plates. Uh, that, that contract actually omitted um, the, any patent right clause. And um, because it was a commercial item type contract, the, the court here actually said that the, the, the patent right clause was not incorporated by operational law under the Christian doctrine. That's an, sort of an interesting side holding that certain contracts, if the uh, IP clauses aren't there, they aren't there no matter what. 
But there was a second contract that's really an issue is, is a CRADA, which is, which is a funding agreement for R&D that was, came on the heels of the procurement contract. And it included the licensing provisions um, for patents, okay? So the standard patent provisions were, were there. And um, which is, as Kelsey said, the Army gets a license in, in whatever uh, invention, subject inventions are developed uh, during the period of performance of the CRADA. Now, the, the, you know, what you'll see here and what the, what the contractor may have lost sight of was what is the invention? Because um, it was developing a lot of different pieces and components. It, but fundamentally, the, the court found the invention was a, a vehicle, a highly survivable urban utility vehicle, the entire thing on wheels. Um, and uh, the um, contractor fi filed patents after the contracts were performed, but it claimed that, that it had uh, an invention uh, before the contracts were, were performed. And so, um, and so what, what happened, and, and we're gonna get back into you know, what happened is um, the, this dispute arose because after performance these contracts, the Army disclosed uh, the design of the vehicle to other contractors. It, it ordered the production and purchased thousands of vehicles, the case says, from other, from competitors of the contractor, which you, know, you can imagine their disappointment. And they wanted damages for infringement of their patent. Um, and they basically said, look, we, we had this vehicle, uh, it was at the stage of being a patentable invention before we got the CRADA. And therefore, you know, whatever we delivered to you under the CRADA was background IP. It wasn't, the, the, you know, it wasn't what was developed under the CRADA. And so you've infringed our privately developed patent um, and you don't have a license to it. Um, the Army claimed that the, subject, that the vehicle became a subject invention under the CRADA and therefore it had unlimited rights and it could disclose the invention and have it produced by other contractors. And so the contractor in this case filed a complaint with the Court of Federal Claims. Next slide. And so you'll kind of see the, the ambiguity here. And what I'm hoping we'll, you'll take away from this is it's all about planning. It's about keeping your eye on what the invention is, understanding what's the test for subject invention under a, a federal contract and making sure you, you, you are being intentional about what you're doing. So the contractor had tested the arm, the tested the armor for the vehicle before the CRADA and the test was successful. So the armor worked for its intended purpose, but they did not, and they never put the armor on a vehicle with wheels. And so uh, there was a question, well, are you really testing the invention there? Uh, then, um, uh, then the, the, the procurement contract did not call for delivery of a vehicle. It called for delivery of a, the chassis of the vehicle in demonstration of the manufacturing capability. So the, the contractor felt it had, a, in, you know, had conceived this invention, and it also felt that it, it had actually built it in its factory and tested it to some degree, although, as you'll see, they had a hard time proving that to the court. So the, um, the CRADA comes in in February of 2007, and it calls for the integration of the armor onto the vehicle. So that's where you start seeing the vehicle showing up into the contract work. And in uh, right, um, the, the month after the CRADA was entered, the contractor delivered two vehicles for testing to the Army for, for threat munitions testing. You know, they basically wanted to see how fire things at the uh, vehicles and see how well it protected um, the, the interior and it, and it did well and it, it passed the test. And so what the court found is that, well, the, based on the record we had, the first time the vehicle ended up in a physical form that it, you know, was after the crater was signed and the, the contractor didn't have good records. They, you know, it was kind of their burden. They had the opportunity and they couldn't convince the court that the vehicle had been put together. They had photographs of, of a vehicle, but the photos weren't dated. And it wasn't clear that the, the, the photographs that the vehicle, you know, had the engine inside of it. Uh, it, it gets down to that degree of, of, you know, when you have to show, when you're trying to show you put uh, your invention into physical form, you need to, you know, have really good records of that. Um, and so they, they were unable to prove that. So that's a, sort of step one, that, that, that their invention, even though it was conceived, it was being when it was actually reduced to practice. Step one, physical form was uh, during the CRADA. And then the other part of, of 
reducing an invention that, to practice is, is, does it work for its intended purpose? And they, they, the court found that the Army's uh, munitions testing uh, did the job there. And, and that was the first time. And the contractor tried to argue they had, not only had they constructed this vehicle before the creator, they had done some testing, but they just didn't have the goods. They, they couldn't make the case, which, uh, and, and so the court was left with, this was the best evidence that of when the uh, vehicle was first tested. Next slide. And so this is how it boiled down. So again, you know, the test for an invention, as Kelsey noted, it's it's two things. It's conceived. When when was your invention conceived, um, or when is it first actually reduced to practice? So, and this is a case where the, the contractor probably had conceived of its invention before the creator, but what happened is it stubbed its toe. It accidentally first reduced it to practice under the CRADA, and it granted the government this unlimited rights license, uh, much to its chagrin and surprise. And so the two elements of reducing an invention to, to practice is physical embodiment and demonstration it works for intended its intended purpose. You kind of saw the story how that happened under, under the CRADA. Um, and so again, I, uh, the contractor here is, uh, has appealed this to the federal circuit. The uh, oral argument was over the summer. So there may be a, a follow-up to this, but this, this case uh, already, I think, teaches some important lessons. Next slide. So the idea is understand that subject invention test. And, and again, if you have something on paper, uh, the fact that you, know, you can patent it, or if, even if you, you know, have patented, you run the risk when you can, when you reduce it to, uh, when you've applied rather, when you have applied, you, you run into a problem where if you, you develop it further and um, reduce it to actual practice, you can give the government rights you do not intend. And then um, maintaining documentation. This contractor had a hard time, at least the way the court looked at it, of showing when, when it was conceived, when it was physically embodied and when they determined it worked. And then the takeaway from this is to strategically plan your development work. You know, you, you want to use funding for, for, you know, development of patentable technology or, or technical data or software in a way that makes sense for you. And, and you want to, you know, you can think about doing things in phases. You can think about when things are conceived, when they're reduced to practice. Uh, sometimes it just makes sense to use the federal funding and let the government have its license. But there is an opportunity to think strategically, and that's kind of what this this case shows: the the risks of not thinking strategically about development. Next slide, Kelsey. You want to cover this? That's a, yeah, that's a huge help, David, and um, and some great lessons learned there. Um, one of the other issues that come up um, is is if there is an infringement by the government. So then, how do we determine damages and this is another uh, even more recent case. Um, Kelsey, do you want to talk us through how this was sorted out um, when, when there was an infringement by the government? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so what's interesting about this case is um, the October 2021 decision came after protracted years and years of litigation between the parties. Um, and so I'll start briefly like where the dispute started and then we'll get to the damages part. But basically what happened is the contractor security point holdings had a patent for um, the me a method to move the security trays around uh, airports. So, you know, when you're going through the TSA checkpoints, um, those trays. So the contractor had a patent on that um, that uh, was granted in 2005. Um, well, then at some point, uh, TSA would have a contract with Security Point, and TSA started to use Security Point's patented system um, and was trying to negotiate a license with Security Point so that they could use it. But the, the, the negotiations failed, and TSA was not granted a license. Um, <clears throat> And in 2011, Security Point filed a lawsuit to uh, claiming that uh, the government TSA was infringing on the patent without, you know, compensating Security Point. Um, so it, it's undisputed. The government conceded that it actually had infringed on the pat patent. Um, the government stipulated, yes, we have made unauthorized use of the patent, but the government um, minimized the extent of the use. Or their argument was like, was that we, you know, 
it was only a very, very small infringement, whereas the contractor claimed that TSA was using this uh, method, their patented method in all airports under TSA's control. So um, the Court of Federal Claims held that it was a valid patent. The government, um, it was stipulated that the government infringed, but the parties couldn't decide uh, the uh, damages. The party couldn't, parties could not decide how much security point was owed for the government's infringement. Um, and so then it, uh, the court looked at the statute, which is 28 USC 1498, which is the statute that provides the remedy for patent infringement, but it's not very clear or specific. It just says that the remedy is recovery of reasonable entire compensation for the use and manufacturer. Um, so the court, you know, looked at the statute and was like, okay, you know, let's go from there. How, but how do we figure out what, what that means, reasonable and entire compensation for such use and manufacture? Um, and then the court looked to a 1970 uh, Southern District of New York decision um, where the, that court determined um, that compensation for patent infringement should be determined by constructing a hypothetical negotiation scenario where a willing licensor and licensee um, enter into an agreement. Um, the Georgia Pacific uh, test was adopted by the Federal Circuit in 1995, um, and then this is the test that uh, the Court of Federal Claims relied on and the parties, the parties agreed that this is how it should be decided, um, this hypothetical negotiation situation. Um, and then, so the hypothetical, so now that we've, you know, we've got the framework, the hypothetical negotiation system is what would the parties have agreed to if they had negotiated the license rights or the rights at the time um, that, you know, that the, the infringement occurred at the time that the patent was, uh, was given. Um, and to decide this question, um, the court had to look at the extent of the unauthorized use. Um, so was it widespread? Did the government get, you know, a benefit from it, um, et cetera? And then also the next step was then determining how to calculate the royalties. Um, so this extensive uh, fact and expert discovery went on in this case. Um, both parties had several experts that, that testified over the government's use. Um, but what was critical to the contractor's case is that the, um, the court pretty much rejected the government's um, analysis that, you know, the government's position that it wasn't, uh, that it hadn't really used the patent, uh, not very much, you know, it hadn't, it hadn't really used this widespread infringement of the patent like the contractor claimed. So the court rejected that and found um, that TSA had installed it uh, and used the patented method um, and extracted significant benefits from it as a result. So the, the court found in favor of the contractor on the unauthorized use, the extent of the unauthorized use. And then the question was, okay, so how do we, we understand that the government infringed um, it was widespread use, the government benefited from it, but then how do we, dam how do we determine um, damages to the contractor? And so now we go back to this hypothetical negotiation situation. Um, and the question, the first question is whether um, the contractor or whether the parties would have negotiated a lump sum payment or would, have they, would they have agreed to a running royalty rate? Um, which is, you know, critical question in terms of uh, damages here. Um, and the court, in, in reaching this, the court decided to put itself in the shoes of the negotiators in 2005 when the patent was granted and, you know, trying to determine what the agency would have accepted, what the contractor would have, um, would have agreed to as well. And the, by finding that there, there were 17 years left on the patent at the time in 2005, um, and the possibility that the agency could adopt ways to avoid use of the patent, um, it seemed that the agency would not have locked itself into a lump sum royalty. And so the court, you know, thinking back in time, if they were negotiators at the time, they said it, a, a running royalty rate is probably what the parties would have agreed to. Um, and then, okay, so now we, we decided we got the running royalty rate, but then what is that rate? What's that rate going to be? Um, and the court there um, had decided or they, they concluded that they would base the calculation for the royalty rate on the number of passengers that pass through the security gates using the contractor's patented method. Um, it, it suggested that this was the only TSA data available to, to kind of calculate, you know, the, the use of this, you know, down to the, you know, singular level. Um, 
And so the court then uh, decided that they were going to determine the rate based on um, the number of passages that pass passengers that pass through the security gate using this patented system. Um, and that's how they, you know, they they adjusted it and, and came up with the, the damages figure, um, which what resulted in a preliminary preliminary award of $103 million um, to the contractor to be up, uh, adjusted upwards after um, the date use of for calculation based on interest and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, a long, very long winded way, but this case is interesting in that because we don't typically see a lot of cases where the damages calculation is is kind of walked through and, and you know, a, arrived at a number that uh, really fits that, um, reasonable and entire compensation uh, as described in the, the patent infringement statute. Um, so really interesting. I'd, I'd encourage anyone who's interested in this to, to read it yourselves too, because it's, it's, very, um, it's very dense, but I think it's really helpful and it's got some good information in there. That's great. Thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, very unusual case. Um, all right, let's move on now to um, SBIR. So we're talking about small business innovative research program. Um, we're a little bit behind, so we're going to have to plow through this one pretty quickly. Um, but in a nutshell, I'll just lay out the, the level set. This is there's generally three phases. Um, the government is trying to commercialize new uh, technology, um, and it pr creates its own separate set of rights. Um, it follows generally the technical data and commercial software rights that Kelsey mentioned at the beginning. Um, but unlike a, a normal contract. This provides for, for the most restricted rights um, for a certain period of time. And then after that, the government gets unlimited rights. And that's even though the government may have paid for some of the development. So it doesn't follow the normal rules um, of technical data or commercial software that we see, which makes it an advantageous program generally um, for, the, for the contractor to be sure. And the contractor wants to sort of protect that restricted time as, as long as possible. Um, and there have been some recent developments in this area. And David, maybe you can just hit on the most important ones uh, that you think contractors should know um, moving away from here. Sure. Well, you know, there's a lot of M&A activity involving phase one and phase two contracts because uh, the, there's no size limit for phase three. So, so large businesses can get phase three contracts. Now, phase three contracts are really procurement contracts and, and they can be sole source procurement contracts. So this is a very interesting opportunity because there's no size limit. Uh, the competition requirements have been satisfied by phase one and phase two. And so a lot of large companies are interested in, in phase one and phase two um, SBIR data. Uh, so the, the trick here, the, in a case, a um, uh, little, uh, just a, it's a, it, back in tw late 2019, but I think it's still a, a lesson percolating through the community, is, is you really have to pay attention to the entity that, that you acquired that, that, that performed the phase one and phase two work. So before this case, there was sort of some uncertainty that, okay, you, you acquire the, the phase one or phase two um, contractor, as a subsidiary, then, then, any, then any entity in your corporate family can go bid and receive a phase three award. Um, and it turns out that's not the case. And, and, and GAO sustained a protest where that, that, that's the scenario that happened, that, that um, a, a contractor acquired the, the SBIR entity, and then it had another entity in its corporate family try to get the phase three. It, reference the phase one or phase two data that had been performed by the company they'd acquired. Um, competitor uh, protested and GAO said, you know what? The, the company who's bidding for the phase three is not the holder uh, and was not responsible for performing the phase one and phase two work. And there's been no novation or no recognition that this entity is a successor in interest. Um, and they just sort of did a formal parsing of the words in the um, SBIR policy directive uh, so the lesson the here is when you when you acquire an SBIR phase one phase two uh, contractor, you, that's either going to be the the entity that you ride into phase three, or if you want some other entity in your organization, you need to formally novate or have the, that organization recognized as, as a successor in interest. Next slide. And then another thing I'm getting, I'm seeing with clients is, um, you know, in 2019, uh, thanks to some statutory reform. 
the, the protection period for SPR data rights uh, was changed. And uh, it used to be uh, four years at civilian agencies and five years at DOD, and it, it could be renewed if you brought the SBIR data forward into a new SBIR award, it would reset. Um, and they've, they've done away with the reset, and now it's just a fixed 20-year SBIR protection period. So where this creates challenges is, is for, for companies in this space who, you know, that you've got SPR data before 2019, that is subject to one protection period. And then now you, if you have new phase ones and phase twos, this is with the 20 year protection period. And then you're using that stuff to continue developing it. Um, and the idea is when you're, when you're bidding, uh, submitting proposals for SBIR, uh, awards of any phase is to do the data rights assertion very clearly and very carefully, reference the contracts, inform the customer of the performance periods, because in a sense, the, the older SBIR data can last longer than 20 years if you keep renewing it. And you just, you just need to educate the customer, write things into proposals, follow up uh, and assert your rights to make sure you, you don't lose really, you know, that long, potentially longer period, depending on how useful this technology is into the future. And then just in your head, in your mind, in your organization, you, you've got to keep everyone on the same page that not our SBIR data is now different depending on civilian or DOD agency in the old, you know, pre-2019 and then 20 years. And we just have to keep that straight because it, it, it can it implicates data rights assertion and, and marking when you deliver. You got to have this, the right marking on it because um, these are now different SBIR clauses. Uh, and then just the value of the company. You know, the M&A is always lurking in the background as, as a, you know, a reason to do SBIR and to grow. And you obviously want to protect these rights and, and keep track of them. Next slide. Okay, we're gonna make one more pivot here um, from SBIR to commercial software licenses. And um, Kelsey again walked us through uh, the general rules with respect to software uh, as it's developed uh, for the contract um, as well as technical data, but there's different rules for commercial software um, than for software that's that's been developed uh, with respect to the contract itself. So. David, if we can stay with you, um, maybe talk us through the distinction, um, what makes something commercial software, and then what are the implications of that as we, as we think through what rights contractors have and what rights they need to um, hand over to the government? Sure. Well, commercial software is a couple of things. First, it's software where there's been, um, it's been developed at private expense. Um, or there are significant modules, seg segregable components of it that are developed at private expense that make it something different than something that was earlier developed for the government. But it's the key is is developed at private expense and offered commercially to you know in the, in the non-federal marketplace. Um, and what I'm teaching here is is where I see get some clients that that have uh, learning the hard way is to make sure that you get your commercial terms and conditions incorporated into your federal contracts. Uh, a lot of people have form, you know, have, have done their commercial T's and C's for their software licenses and, um, you know, and, and they, they can get a little sloppy um, in terms of going through the, the belt and suspenders of making sure they are in their federal prime contract. So, because um, the policy is to recognize and, and abide by the commercial licenses. And that's, this is what the FAR, uh, this policy is laid out in FAR 27.405. Um, the licenses can be incorporated by reference, but, you, but what I'm going to teach is you have to be very careful about that. And there's some, some new case law that might raise questions or give the government some arguments if you haven't done it with particularity. So that's, gonna, that's really where I'm heading with the bottom line here. Um, next slide. And just, you know, the process is you submit your commercial license to the government. There's, there's a couple of minimum rights the government's supposed to make sure they have and the contracting officer, and they're listed here, it's, it's you know, it's pretty, pretty uh, normal stuff, uncontroversial stuff, just, just protecting themselves for backup purposes and that kind of thing. Next slide. And the procedure in the FAR, they, they tell contracting officers that they are, have to ensure and exercise caution that the standard commercial license meets the government's needs. Um, next slide. And in 2018, there was a very favorable, very pro-commercial pro software 
case out of the ASBCA uh, involved a, a dispute over um, the government breaching and, and not making too many copies and not tracking the, the copies it made of, of a commercial software. Um, and the, the government argued, well, you know what, you, you gave us a link to your software, but we never read it. And you know, how can we be bound by something the contracting officer never read? Next slide. And the ASPCA rightly just applied the, the, the policy of FAR 27, and it's a little harsh on the government, but that is the policy is we, we want commercial software, so we know we have to abide by those terms. And the, the FAR put a duty to inquire on the, on the CO and the fact that the CO never clicked and reviewed the commercial license doesn't mean it's not enforceable against the government. And so there, there was the light, the commercial license was enforceable. It was in the contract because there was a link in the proposal that was clear. Um, and that really helped Siasoft in that situation. Next slide. Now there's a recent case out of the Civilian Board of, of Contract Appeals. Um, it's not a software case, but it's a case about the incorporation of commercial terms and conditions into the GSA schedule. So the, the and this is where I think this, this should give everyone pause and, and make you revisit the policies and procedures and training of people who are doing proposals and contract formation for commercial software license. So the, the issue in this case, I won't get into all of the details, but you know this had to do with did this contractor CSI Aviation incorporate its commercial terms and conditions into its GSA schedule. And there were some references to its T's and C's, but they were not attached to its proposal. Um, there was no real clear link. Um, uh, there, there, was, there were copies, various copies. This is one where the contractor updated its terms and conditions over time and over a four or five year period, there were several copies of the terms and conditions in the contract file, but it wasn't in, in clear and from the government's contract file, where, was that actually submitted with the proposal? What, which version was attached to which modification? It was a mess and there was no clarity um, in, in, in factually. Next slide. And so this standard, the, the, the civilian board has applied a very high standard. They, they, they took this case called Northrop Grumman from the federal circuit from 2008 and they've applied it to commercial contracts. Now this, this may be a little contrary to commercial practice, which is a tension here. But this is, this is where the civilian board comes on these things. To incorporate material in a contract by reference, the host, in the host document, which would be the proposal or the prime contract itself, must identify with detailed particularity. Those are important words, detailed particularity, what specific material it incorporates and clearly indicate where the material um, is found. Uh, the incorporating contract must use language that is expressed and clear and leaves no ambiguity um, about the identity of the document being referenced, nor any reasonable doubt, not just a doubt, any reasonable doubt about the fact that the reference document is being incorporated into the contract. And then they even took a shot at SciSoft, which is why I, this sort of a, a flag went up in my mind. Um, the party said, well, SciSoft, you know, that's commercial software, but it's a commercial item. And, and that's the same test. And the court said, ah, well, you know, SciSoft is non-binding on us and the civilian boards. And this, this is the, the board that hears disputes over every civilian agency. Uh, and we do not find it instructive because they didn't apply this North of Grumman federal circuit standard that I just outlined above re requiring a lot of clarity and particularity. Uh, and they said it was, it was software licenses somehow governed by regulation. Now that may be, that may save SciSoft for, for um, commercial licenses in the civilian side, but at the same time, this this argument gives the this this case gives the government some arguments that maybe it didn't realize it had. Next slide. And so the bottom line for the court was neither CSI's offer nor its commercial price list referred to this the, to its terms and conditions using express clear language. And so it it found that the the, the terms and conditions were not incorporated. Next slide. So what this means is, you know, SciSoft is it's still good law at DOD. So with DOD for commercial software licenses, you know, if you have a clear link in your proposal and the CO doesn't review it, the, it's you're still going to be able to enforce your commercial license. But I, the better practice is if you're going to incorporate 
is to make sure the people writing the proposals know the standard and identify it with detailed particularity, which where the license is. And if, you know, that means a specific link. An issue I see is that people update their T's and C's using the same link. And that is something that can, can cre create problems, um, especially if you have a dispute later, is proving up what version was, was there on the link on the date you needed it to be there. You may want to create different links now when you update your terms and conditions. And I see some companies doing that where they have, this, these were our T, T's and C's on this date. And then here's our T's and C's on the new date. And they have a web page that just sort of lists what was in place for what time period. And that's probably the better practice if you're going to try to meet the standard of CSI and, and, and specify with detailed particularity. Then the, be the best practice, the guarantee, is to not rely on, on incorporation at all. Uh, just print out your commercial license and put it with your proposal as an attachment or an addendum. Uh, if, if you're submitting electronically, it would be a separate PDF. You, you can combine it with the PDF, your proposal, but the best practice and the guarantee to make sure your commercial software license applies is to actually physically include it in the proposal so there's no doubt. Next slide. And then another um, interesting case um, uh, for a commercial software is this uh, bit management case that was decided earlier this year in the federal circuit. In this case, um, gives creates some new mechanisms to enforce a commercial software license, um, including the requirement that the, the government keep track of how many users have, have received the, the software. So the, the basic facts here is bit management, they sell commercial software for 3, 3D visualization. And through a reseller, so through an intermediary uh, who was the prime contractor, the Navy acquired uh, approximately 100 single computer licenses. And then the Navy proceeded to install the software on over 400,000 computers. Um, and bit management found out about this and they sued for infringement. And the Navy argued, hey, we didn't violate anything. We had an implied in fact license with which it complied. And the Court of Federal Claims had agreed. Next slide. And the Federal Circuit said, well, not so fast, Navy. Um, First, they, they agreed, they went with the idea, which, which bit management was trying to fight, that the Navy did have an implied in fact license. And that, that is surprising, I think, for commercial software companies that if your license doesn't end up in the prime contract, even by reference, that somehow it can be implied in fact, you know. And, and in this case, there was facts about conversations between bit management and the Navy, the conduct of the parties. There was a course of dealing that from which the Navy could establish there was a meeting of the mind. And that's what the proof standard is. Was there a meeting of the mind to have an implied in fact license? And, and so these, it's not going to happen in every case, but the facts were there in this case. Um, and they said, you know, yeah, Navy had an implied in fact license, but what the Court of Federal Claims never considered was, well, what were the terms of that license? And did the Navy breach it? And the Federal Circuit found that the, this implied in fact license had required the Navy to, to use this Flexera technology to limit uh, and track the number of users of the software and it had failed to do that. Um, and so it had it had copy infringed on the copyright and breached by breaching the, the implied in fact license. And the court sent it back to, to the Court of Federal Claims to determine the damages. Uh, next slide. So that's that's big news. Um, that you know, if there's going to be an implied in fact theory uh, available to the government, it's it's helpful to, to the commercial software company that all the terms and conditions can be there if there's that meeting of the minds, including this requirement to track. And then probably the biggest news, one of the problems with tracking use, use in the government is you just can't get access. These are, these are classified systems or secured systems. It's, you don't want to bother the customer to actually go in and, and find out who's using it. Well, the Federal Circuit said, well, when there's a dispute, when there's copyright infringement and then the dispute over damages, they have to do this hypothetical negotiation, but the, Navy, the burden is on the government to show what its actual usage was, which, and they're in the better position, they have access to this data. So rather than a big discovery fight and, and you know, not, not being sure you have, can get access to the information, the, the, the government has to come forward and prove its actual usage, which is a, sort of a, a big, a big uh, development legally. Um, and should be helpful to enforcement of, of license agreements in the future. Next slide. Great. 
Well, thanks for that, David, um, and some really interesting cases there. Uh, Kelsey, we can go back to you now with a few minutes we have left, um, and maybe you can talk us through these new proposed DFARS rules. Um, and worth noting, these are not, they've not been implemented. Is that right? Um, these are still in the comment period. So um, tell us what may be coming on the horizon if, if these get finalized. Yeah, I, I'm, I think, I believe the comment period is expired, but I think it's, um, they're still in the works in terms of the FAR Council and the DFARS Council considering it. Um, but there are a number of proposed DFARS amendments uh, to DFARS 227. And um, up here, we've, we've got a few of them. And, and one of them is the negotiation of price for technical data um, and the preference for specially negotiated license rights. Um, it encourages and requires uh, basically the, uh, the negotiation of a price for the technical data before uh, making uh, the selection, source selection decision or awarding the contract. Um, so pricing up front. Uh, the second DFARS rule um, is uh, pr will provide for a presumption of the development at exclusively at private uh, expense um, for commercial items unless DOD can demonstrate that the item was not actually developed at private expense. I believe in the in the advance notice of proposed rulemaking, um, they noted that this is uh, this has kind of always been the case, but they wanted to codify this um, you know this presumption just to just to be clear. Um, and then the last one is a proposed rule concerning non-commercial computer software, um, which will require uh, the consideration of certain matters that were required by the NDAA uh, before, um, before entering into uh, agreements for concerning non-commercial computer software, including uh, requiring the government to obtain associated license rights and necessary license rights for the uh, computer software. So, okay. And um, any sort of big ticket items as far as um, how this may impact contractors? I mean, it sounds like thinking through uh, how you may have to um, monetize some of your license rights if, uh, if the government requires that and then making that strategic decision on whether to accept that provision or not. Um, it sounds like there may be some some room for the government to evaluate based on some of those criteria. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. I think as a blanket statement, um, we're, we're looking at there's probably going to be more negotiation in terms of pricing this technical data and uh, more a preference for specially negotiation license rights. Um, so so kind of, I guess, more wiggle room than we've seen before. So just something to keep an eye on. Great. Um, Okay, so we've got a couple questions here in just a couple of minutes. So um, here's a, a few takeaways. Uh, data rights are not self-executing. Know what your IP rights document um, up front and, and understand the challenges of record keeping, marking deliverables, um, negotiation with subcontractors, that can turn into a huge issue um, and understanding the type of transaction you're performing and how that drives uh, the chart that Kelsey had up in terms of where you fall um, and then and then protecting uh, making sure the government has the fewest amount of use rights uh, in the case of, uh, of data rights and, and commercial software. David we had a couple questions about SBIR so maybe we can circle back to those with, with the couple minutes we have here. Somebody wanted to confirm that it's just SBIR as far as the 20-year period that's just SBIR not STTR. Um, I think is true, um, but correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, I, to be honest, I need to go check that just because I, I keep track of the SBIR much more. It's much more part of my practice. And I definitely I remember the statute applying to SBIR and I just haven't, you know, I don't have it memorized. So I'll, I'll follow up on that with the, with the person who asked the question. Okay. And then um, with SBIR rights, can the government utilize a third party contractor to service and maintain the software developed under the SBIR contract, or are they compelled to use the small business developer? Um, I think there's some flexibility there. What do you think, David? Yeah, if, if you look at the, they, they, the government can use a, what they call a covered government support contractor uh, to do uh, uh, maintenance, uh, modification, reproduction. Um, but the idea, you know, that's somebody, it's, it's basically, still being used you know within the government and they just have a different company helping them and that, that company has to have non-disclosure agreements um, 
with the government. So there's still some protection there, but there is flexibility. In, and you'll find that in the, 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 I'm looking at the DOD clause right now, 252-227-7018. And SBI or data rights, are, are, they're actually defined as uh, limited rights for technical data, restricted rights for, for software for that 20 year period. And when you look at the definition of limited rights, uh, you'll, you'll see the, the exception, the general rules that has to stay within the government. It cannot be shared with a contractor, but there's a, an exception for a covered government support contractor. And that's where you, you'll, you'll get more information there. Great. Um... Had the original performer under the SBIR case signed a novation agreement with the company that procured them, would that alone have been sufficient to allow the new company to retain the original rights protection? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's, you know, there's not a lot of uh, case law, um, you know, on specifically on that point. So, you know, the, I think there's some so potentially some risk there. Uh, but, you know, that would be an art, a position to take. This is what I can tell you. I'm looking at the SPIR policy directive. Um, and if you go down to uh, page 85, that's where you see the, uh, the, the part about novated and successor and interest contracts. That I can tell you the low, lower risk, the better practice is to get the government's approval for that. Even if the uh, phase one or phase two has been completed, is to get recognized as the successor and in interest. Um, you know, there, there shouldn't be a lot of controversy about that because the work has been done and everyone knows, you know, phase, there's no size limit. Um, but there's a, a sentence there that sort of, you know, says, for example, in order to receive a phase three award, the awardee must have, and I may use the word must, again, this is what the government would, are, would show, uh, would point to, must have either received the prior phase one or phase two award uh, or been novated a phase one or phase two award. Um, and, and innovation, especially here, usually means the government is the one doing the novating. I mean, that's that's the practice under the anti-Simon Acts. We have got, you know, FAR, FAR 4212. So the reference to novation here, the government would argue that's a contracting officer action. That's not something that the phase one or phase two awardee can do unilaterally. This is unresolved. So I, I, it's possible that it's not does, they don't foreclose that that novation is enough. So I'm not telling you, you know, that it's not possible. But if I was doing this going forward, the better practice would be to get get the government signature because then the government has no argument. You're not a successor in interest. Yeah. Okay. One more. Um, we're almost out of time. But the FAR clauses have forms for assertion of the different IP rights. What are your experiences with those forms? Are they sufficient? Are they sufficiently clear? And in fact, being used. Um, I've seen it mostly on the DFAR side, to, um, and, and, and I, I, they are used on a regular basis, is my experience. Um, and, and in terms of the clarity, um, my sense is yes, for the most part, although there's a pretty significant burden on the contractor to make sure you've flagged your background IP or the IP that you've developed um, with contractor dollars, with private dollars. Um, so I would, I would say yes to both. Um, David, I'll start with you. Any follow on or different thoughts about yeah, that? You, you, they are used and you absolutely need to use them. There's some case laws where, case law where contractors have tried to deviate from them and, and the government takes the position that, well, you know, the clause says use this language. And so the, the best practice and the, the guarantee, especially when it's restricted rights, government, something less than, than unlimited rights, use the magic words that are in the clause, that way you lock in contractually that you've made the right marking. And, and that is what I see in my practice uh, companies doing. Yep. Okay, I think we're gonna have to end it there because we're, we're a minute over, but we sure appreciate everybody taking time out of your day with us. Um, I think the slides will be available to have our contact information. If there's any follow-ups, we'd love to talk more about any of these issues. Uh, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks again for joining us.